Alpha, Minister James Williams, Jacqueline Williams, Sharon Woods, Marilyn Smith, Michael Williams, Randall Williams, and the entire family of Nathaniel Williams. Psalm 116, 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Whereas the Lord has seen fit to call from labor to reward the souls of your dear son and brother, Nathaniel Williams, we the members of the Alpha and Omega Church would like to extend to you our condolences and heartfelt sympathy. We realize no mere words could ever fill the void you are experiencing, but please know that you and your family are in our prayers. It is in times like this that it is good to know that God promises to be our help and our strength and to never leave us or forsake us. Our prayer for you is that you find comfort and strength in the Lord as you trust and lean on him. Weep if you must, for even Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. But also know that the Bible declares in Psalm 35, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. The word of God also reminds us in Revelations 21 and 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Please know that the pastor and members of Alpha and Omega are praying for you, and we offer to you whatever support we can. And whether our hands and our efforts are not enough, we know God will be there to see you through. We also pray that the love of God will continuously fill your hearts as you fondly remember your loved one on today and in the days of come. Now may the grace, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen. Prayerfully submitted this day, January 7, in the year of our Lord, 2021, we propose that a copy of this resolution be given to the family and an additional copy be kept in the files of the Alpha and Omega MB Church. Pastor Ricky Harris, Senior Pastor, to my family, God has all eyes on us. Whatever it is we need, if we be what we should be, say our prayers and keep walking. Treat other people like you want to be treated. Life story. Nathaniel Bernard Williams was born on May 2, 1955, in Acmar, Alabama, to the union of James Williams, Mustafa, and Carrie J. Williams. He was the eldest of this union. As a child, he attended the Zion Temple Pentecostal Church in Chicago, Illinois. He attended R. Nathaniel Delt Grammar School, McKinley Upper Grade Center in Chicago, Illinois, and Akmar High School in Akmar, Alabama. He also served in the U.S. Army in the early 70s and was medically discharged. He was employed at Zenith where he worked until they closed. Afterwards, he worked at various other places of employment. Nate was always a very hard worker. Nathaniel B. Williams 
departed this life on December 27, 2020. He was preceded in death by his mother, Carrie Williams, three uncles, Lemuel Underwood, Samuel Williams, and George Williams, and five aunts, Edna Cole, Wilma Bohannon, Linda Raglan, Linda Williams, and Doretta Bell. He lives to care, cherish his memories, his father, Bishop James Matafa, three brothers, Minister James Williams, founder of Maywood, Illinois, Michael Williams and Randall Williams, both of Chicago, Illinois, three sisters, Jacqueline Williams, Marilyn Smith, and Sharon Woods Cornelius, all of Chicago, Illinois, eight nieces, nine nephews, 27 great nieces and nephews, two great, great nieces, five uncles, four aunts, and a host of other relatives and friends. I am the first aunt. He was born in 1955 in Alabama. I was only nine years old when he was born. He was the first grandchild to be born. He was the first grandchild to leave. But we know he was 65 years old, so that tell you how old I am. Amen. Now, according to modern day math, that means you're 23. <laughs> you're 47. I'm sorry. I've got, I missed it by a little bit. But as we are here for this family, know that you're in our hearts, you're in our prayers. I mean, I can honestly say that um, this is my, because literally it is my family. Um, I married into the family, but I feel like I've been been a part of the family, I mean, mostly, almost all of my life, honestly, because I got married at such a young age. But I want you to know that we're here, we're praying for you, whatever we can do, we're here for you. You know how much we love you, and our support is with you uh, to, we, we, we call him Bishop, but he's also Pops. You, you know that we love him with all our hearts. He's been a great inspiration all of my life as a teenager. Uh, I got to know him, and he would drive us around on the church bus. And we would go places, and uh, they never complained about where they took us. They took us, and we ate, and we just had fun. Thank you for being such a great man of God, and I thank you for your family and uh, sharing your family with me. And eventually, some of them even became a part of our church family. And we thank God for you and know that we're here for you. Whatever we can do, that's what we're here for. At this time, I don't know if anybody wants to have anything to say, uh, but I want to give you that opportunity real quickly because we're supposed to be leaving here in a few minutes. So if anybody really wants to say anything, I want to give you that opportunity before I uh, officially bring Minister Williams up, amen, for our final prayer, and then we'll have our benediction. So if anybody wants to say something, I want to give you that opportunity. Amen. Okay, everyone, so I'm pretty sure everyone here knows me. I'm Candy. I'm Bernard Smith, um, one of Sharon's twins. And I wanted to get up here and say something because um, even though I know that Bernard, we all know Bernard was a little bit different. He really did, was a loner. He didn't really deal with people too much. But he did have, you know, his picks and chooses who he wanted to deal with. My sister and I, we were a part of that little chosen few that he actually did deal with. And so I um, just wanted to share a couple of little stories about some of the encounters or some of the things <laughs> that um, other people don't know. So one thing um, about my uncle, he was very, very caring. You know, you, even though he'll tell you to get out the way, leave him alone so he could just do what he's doing, he was very caring. I remember um, one summer he came up, um, we were on the porch on the port, and he came and he um, rode up on the bike he had. It was a um, Harley Davidson Charles, um, 
um, sharper bike. And so, and I mean, I was an adult already. I don't know how old I was, but I was fully grown. He came up on the bike and I was like, but now you know where you get that bike from? That bike really, really nice. I like that bike. And he was like, you do? I'm like, yeah. So he got off the bike and he started blowing the horn on the bike and showing me all the trinkets that he had. And I was like, yeah, that bike really, really nice. He was like, oh, oh, okay, I'm glad you like it. So 24 hours later, my Uncle Red called me and said, girl, where you want me to put this bike at? I said, what are you talking about? He said, Bernard didn't have me to come and pick this bike up. I'm like, what bike? He said, you said you like that bike and Bernard bought you a bike. I said, you got to be kidding me. And so, sure enough, I said, okay, drop it off over here. He dropped it off to my mom's house, same exact bike. I'm like, uh-uh, so I called Bernard. I'm like, Bernard, thank you. And he said, you said you like that, I just want to make sure you were straight. So the next day, uh, I told my sister, I said, Bernard, got me this bike, girl. She said, oh, I'm on the bike too. Next day, she had a bike too. I was like, okay. So, you know, he did, and then when, um, he always just wanted to make sure, you know, he was okay. He said, I, I just want to make sure he's straight. Um, when my Uncle Rand was doing some work around my house, he kept, you know, it was certain tools that he had, but some tools he didn't have, so he'll come back like, I don't got that tool. I'm like, okay, then the next day he come back like, oh, I got it. Cause you know, we was like, well, we can rent it from Home Depot or something. He like, oh, I got it, I'm like, where you get it from? But nah, so this happened about three, four times, and I said, well, how about not keep getting it? But now nah, I was going to buy the tools. So he kept telling me, you said you needed it, man. So he was going to buy, he said, cause I want to make sure you get our house right. I want to make sure you do it. You know, so you, I was like, oh, wow. Like, why are you doing that? He like, cause I just got to make sure you straight. That's what he said, that was his little thing. So I'm like, oh, okay. You know, and we were just, I would just come and just talk to him and, and you know, just listen to some, some of the stuff he said probably wasn't appropriate, but I would just sit, take the time and talk with him and sit with him and think. It was also one of the reasons why I was so, um, I, I was so passionate about, about being a psych. You know, I've been a psych nurse since 2006 and um, a house supervisor in psych and I absolutely love it because, you know, some people, they know that you might have some type of issues or mental health issues or something, they just write you off. But it was just something that was dear to my heart because I'm like, well, you have people that are experiencing this. You know, you need to see what's going on with them. Hear them out. Don't just write them off like, oh, that person crazy because they people too. And you just, you know, never really know. So it was one secret that he had for me apparently that other people knew I didn't know. And um, I found out the other day I was talking to um, one of the guys from the neighborhood, um, Joe, and he was telling me about another person that passed from um, LaPorte. And so he ended up saying to me, you know, well, I know you might not make it to that funeral, but I know you're going to be at Morande's funeral, right? So I'm like, no, I'm not going to be at Morande's funeral because I don't even know who Morande is. <laughs> so I, I get off the phone, I'm like, ma. No, so, so before I get off the phone, I'm like, yeah, oh, he's like, you do know who Morande is? I said, I don't. He said, your uncle. I said, Bernard. <laughs> He said, yeah, that's my Rondé. I'm like, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> so when I get out the phone, I ask my mama, and she like, my Rondé, yeah, 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 that's my I said, wait, who, how many people know about this? So I call Rem, and I call Mike. I'm like, y'all know my Rondé? They busting up laughing. Yeah, that's my that's my I'm like, you mean to tell me I'm the only person don't know this? <laughs> so, okay, I got one more story, y'all. So me and um, a couple of our well, me and a couple of our friends, um, some years back, maybe 2005, we were sitting in front of uh, my grandma's house in um, in, in a, the car. And Bernard, he was on the porch. We had been in and out, you know. He was hollering at us like, "God, keep making me open this door." So he had told me before you leave, you just lock this door. I'm like, okay. So he ended up coming over there to the car. You know, he saw a couple of cars come talk to us. So I guess he wanted to see what was going on. So he ended up coming over to the car, and he looked in the car, and he said, oh, we got a bunch of hoes here. So, so my friends, they freaking out, your uncle just called us hoes, and he said it. So I said, but no, why did you say that? He said, ain't that what y'all call each other? We like, no, no, we don't call each other that. Please don't never say that again. He like, I'm sorry. I thought that's what you're supposed to say. 
I'm like, Bernard, no. So he, he did apologize. He's like, I, I, I'm so, so sorry. I didn't know. I thought that's what she said. I mean, I thought that's what everybody do. You know, I'm like, no. So and I come back with, yeah. So and I had my son, he, he, and he's very observant. Because he knew, like, people think he don't pay attention, but he knew he know my daughter, he know her name is Diamond. And when I came knocking on the door one day to change my son, and like, I got to change him, he like, who? <laughs> I'm like, but not this my baby. He like, where you get him from? I'm like, you know this my baby? He like, is that the Diamond Boy baby too? I'm like, yeah. He like, oh, okay. He like, because that little fellow, I haven't seen him before. I'm like, but no, you seen me the whole pregnancy and everything. He was like, uh-uh, I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> so, you know, I just wanted to, you know, share that with you guys and let y'all know. Like, I know that he probably was, like, fussy, and he was, you know, he was a trip sometimes, but he had a good heart, and he really was a sweet person if you took the time to actually talk to him and know him. So I'm, I'm definitely going to miss my uncle. Is there anyone else that would like to say something on behalf of Nathaniel before I play music? Hey Amen. I did have my part in this program, but um, since everybody is, uh, was uh, roasting my brother, because that's what it takes. <laughs> And, it, and it's a good roasting, you know, because <laughs> uh, the ones who did know him um, had their little, you know, episodes and, and, and little stories that they could tell. And uh, he was my, my oldest, but I'm the second son. So I had a, a, a couple of years in there to, to just, you know, be a, him and I. And I remember... Um, uh, uh, being in the the projects and and having to keep the window raised, and sometimes I froze near. The, I know he had to breathe, but did I have to freeze? So <laughs> this 
he had, he had asthma so bad that he had to, you know, be by the window. And, uh, but I dealt with it. And he was the type of person that these people have just said. He was the type of person that you couldn't talk directly to about something if you needed something done. It was just the kind of person he was. He had his ears open. And uh, there, was a, there was an episode where I needed, we were getting ready to move. And I had a pool table in the basement. And it was a Brunswick pool table. It was a strong built pool table. <clears throat> It took six men to bring the pool table into the house and put it together. So I'm just talking about, you know, how we're going to get this pool table out of here. And so I said, well, I'm going to call Brunswick and have them um, break it down, take it to the new place and set it up. But it was in the earshot of Bernard. So he didn't join in the conversation. He didn't say anything. All I know is he tried to get that pool table out of there by himself. <laughs> it, took, it took six people to get that thing in there. And he was, and he, my, my brother was not a big person. Skinny. You know, I don't know if he thought he had super strength. But in his movie, he broke the pool table. He broke it, and I don't, I can't even remember him saying <laughs> that he broke it. <laughs> we knew he broke it. <laughs> but um, my wife got on him. She got on him time and time. She would call him and she's not, because they had a certain relationship. <laughs> but she would call him and say, you owe me a pool table. You go out and <laughs> No, I never got a chance to get that pool table, but I believe that he would have he would have bought one. <laughs> but um, there was another incident where where I had these two butter churns, and they were they had to be over eighty some years old, and I got them from my aunt Gertrude in in in, uh, in Alabama. So I brought them home, and I put them in the boiler room of my basement. I put them in the boiler room. But I got to talking about how we were cleaning the basement out. In the earshot of my brother. <laughs> he goes over and he tries to clean out the basement, I guess. Went into the boiler room and got, th those things were heavy too. Those butter churns, they were like picking up weights. He took both of them out and put them by the garbage can in, in the outside of the house. So, you know, of course, they took those. <laughs> I was so mad at him. I was, I was beyond words. But I know that he was trying to help. That was, that was his idea. He wanted this done. So I'm going to go ahead and do it for him. And uh, so I appreciate, I appreciate my brother. I used to follow him around when we were kids. I used to. I used to follow him so much that I used to call him Dee Dee. <laughs> Later on, my dad was saying that he was probably saying Daddy. <laughs> I used to follow him because I wanted to do what he was doing. I wanted to be what he didn't want me to be what, doing what he was doing. And I later on understood why. Because <laughs> my, my brother was different. <laughs> my brother would carve a hole in the wall of the project, carve the big plank out so that he can get into the next apartment and then come back before anybody knew he was gone. And we figured out how he get out of the house. I, I should let my dad say this. <laughs> but he went through a hole in the wall. So he, he, was, he was something else. <laughs> and I'm sure that everybody who, like I said, talked to him, they had their little stories about this man, <laughs> this man. But uh, you couldn't help but love him. You couldn't help because he did have a good heart. We argued and fuss all the time, but, you know, family do that. We, we, we never should let 
that lasts. You know, you, you got to get over it. You got to get over it. You can't, you can't keep those things because those things will, will form a cancer and it will eat you. And when that person is gone, you can't say nothing to that person. He's gone to whatever place he's gone. You, he can't hear a word you say. So we have to start thinking in the matter of like, you know, there's us. There's us. We have the breath of God in us. It's us. We should love each other that we're allowed to have an argument. We're allowed to, to get our uh, frustrations off, but don't let it stay there. Get, get rid of that stuff. It's, it's no good. Just love each other. Just love each other. Then when he goes in, you'll have those, you know, those good memories. Yeah, that's what we have to hold on to. That's why I was, I was looking at my brother over there, my brother Mike, and I was saying, Mike, don't, don't cry, because if you cry, then I'll start crying, you know? <laughs> you know, it's just like sneezing. If somebody sneezes over here, whether you know it or not, somebody over there is going to sneeze. And the same thing with a yard. If you yarn, somebody over there is going to yarn. We are connected. So stop paying attention and realizing what's around you. God is love. God is love, and he loved every one of us unconditionally. I know we put conditions on love, but he loves us unconditionally. I don't care what you do. The old folks used to say, as long as the blood is running warm in your vein, you got a chance. So it's important for you to think about it. Think about where your life is. Think where your life is going. Think what your life could be. And just be honest with God. Be honest with yourself. We all have faults. But you know one thing about God is he looks beyond your fault. Because he knows what you need. So let this day be the first day of the rest of our lives. Let us begin to show love. And let me tell you, when you do, it will spread out. It'll be like a pebble in the water. And the ripple will go wider and wider. It's a lot of things I was scared to talk to my brother about because we would get into deep conversation and start, start arguing, but, but it wouldn't last because I'd leave. <laughs> I'd come back later, but I, I was still able to talk to him. He was still trying to look out for his little brother. Let's look out for our family. And the world is our family. We're connected. Whether you realize it or not, we're connected. So if somebody step on your toe, it's okay. You got another toe. <laughs> now if you step on that toe. <laughs> but God is love. Thank you for the life that we had together, bro. I'm the, like my aunt say, she's the, I'm the oldest aunt now. Well, I'm the oldest brother now. <laughs> you can come to me, you can talk to me. Let us reason together, but let us love each other. Man, come on. Hallelujah.
Amen. When I got up earlier, I said, we have till 11 o'clock, we're supposed to be out. And then the funeral director just told me, so you just know y'all got some time. She said, the funeral, the cemetery don't open till 1 o'clock. Nobody, that's not right now? I didn't say the cemetery don't open to 1. <laughs> but I know we're going to long stretch this out a little bit. I know Mr. Nathaniel didn't live to be 65 years and then close out in 30 minutes. It ain't going to happen. <laughs> Amen. 65 years on this earth, he's not going to have a 20 minute funeral. Not if I'm in control. Can I get some music now? James Lester.
about 35 minutes here. So if anybody have anything that they would like to say, you know, it's just knowing people, you know, and as things are right now, we cannot be together like we would mostly be. I know y'all don't like that type of singing. So it's not a situation where it's a great thing that this is what brought us together, but since we are together, we can still talk. And tell a person that you are glad to see them because so many of you I have not seen in a long time. And it's not because I didn't want to see you. It's just that we are in different places. Some of us are working in different places. We have to go to work. Well, of course, I can say I don't have to do it because I've been sitting down for the last 14 years. I retired, and I'm enjoying being at home. The only thing is when the situation that we're in now came up, it took a toll on me for a little while because I wasn't a used, I wasn't cooked to being in the house all the time. And I had to get up and leave out and they're saying, no, don't go out, stay in the house. And for three weeks in the beginning, I stayed in the house for three whole weeks, not even going outside. And that ended me up in a doctor's office from anxiety. They gave me medicine to take, and I was taking it. But after a while, when I asked my daddy to take care of me, and he told me to put the medicine in the drawer, and I put the medicine in the drawer, I don't stay in the house all the time anymore. I stay in there when I want to. That's just about every day. But I go to grocery stores. I don't go shopping for nothing because I don't need nothing. So we have to eat. If anybody need me, they call me, I'm going. I was sick. My daughter called my niece from Alabama and asked her to go come see about me. But my niece sitting over there. When she came up the steps, I looked out the window, I didn't even know who she was. I wondered who she was, cause she had this on, she had plastic around her head, and all of this stuff. But when I opened the door, and she looked at me and she told me, Auntie, you know I love you. Why didn't you call? if you needed something. You have family that loves you. You don't have to be with them every day, but you can pick up the telephone and call them and just talk to them for a little while. You might not call all of them, but if you call Susie, you're gonna ask Susie, well, Susie, did you see John? Have you talked to John? Is he doing okay? That's what we have to do. And believe it or not, just about everybody sitting in this place in here is this family. All of us. It's one or two neighbors or you know your friends on the outside. But as I look down the road, you begin to see faces. And these faces remind you of who they are. This is your family. These are my nieces and that's my husband. My brother is over there. And then they got their children and some of them got grandchildren. I'm a great grandma. So he's far away from me, but he will call me on the phone. And when he see my face, he says, hey, Nana. So that's us, you know, that's me. 
Right now, I have one brother. He's sitting right there. My baby sister is in Birmingham. And I am here. I am the oldest one. And the baby girl is there, and he's in between. But we keep up with each other. James was up here talking about what his brother could do. Well, I got one that can do even more. Guys, like she said, I am the cousin. You know, I've been knowing them all my life. You know, Bernard, he's a special cousin. I knew him even when we was in Alabama. You know, I remember grandmama trying to trying to raise us. Now, we were some bad little boys when we got up here to sit. You know, and grandma, she did her best to try to raise us, right? But we always stayed in trouble with grandma. You know. Y'all don't remember Mud Deal, but I know about Mud Deal. You know, one day we was walking down that road trying to go home, and we saw Bernard run past us. He was like, Phew. we like, where's Bernard going? Then we heard the shotgun, boom! And everybody jumped in the ditch. He like, what's going on? Mud Deal, then Bernard did something to Mud Deal. You know, Mud Deal wasn't nothing to play with, girl. My dear came out of that house with that shotgun, boy. And I remember Bernard shooting down that road. I remember all of us jumping in the ditch. I like, boy, I still love that bunch of my cousin. I still love my granny, because she was very hard on us. Now, another good memory I have of Bernard is, one day me and him was talking. And like you said, he's not a very religious guy. Not at all. He 
was sometime I bring up Jesus to him, and he'd be like, what he done for you? you know? who, who is him? You know what I'm saying? That's, that was my cousin. He was like that. You know? And uh, he had got a snowblower and a riding lawnmower. And uh, he told me, he said, Anthony, I ain't got nowhere to put this snowblower and ride lawnmower. I said, okay, cub, just, just give it to me. You know, I put it over here in my mama's house. He was like, cool, go ahead and come on and get it. So wind up, I needed that lawnmower and that snowblower. After I wind up moving somewhere, I'm like, I can't cut all this walking. That was like a blessing he gave to me was that Ryan lawnmower. And I kept that Ryan lawnmower. And I called him. I said, man, I need to get it fixed. I got a couple of dollars. I'm going to go ahead and have it fixed for him. He said, have it fixed? He said, how much they charge? I said, man, they charge is about four, five hundred. He like, yeah. He said, okay. Next thing I knew, just like uh, Candy was saying, next thing I knew, that money coming in my mailbox to have the lawn more fixed. You know, I was like, you know, when I heard her speaking, I was like, that's definitely his character. That's how he was. You know, and a lot of people didn't understand that's how he was. But I knew how my cousin was. Me and him, when we have our Christmas party, and he be in that back on that back porch, you know, I used to sneak back there that back porch just to talk to him a little while. You know, you guys don't remember that, you know, Jack and him, but y'all remember he was on that back porch. You know, that was his that was his hangout. That's where he stayed. You wanted to find him, he was together. back there. This the last song you know, of the night. We, we gonna miss him though. And even now, even now, when I got sick at one time, you know, I was surprised that he even still called me. You know, he gave me a call. What up, cuz? How you doing? And he talked to me a little while. You know, we, people didn't know that we talked a lot like that. We had a good conversation. You know, we was closer than people know. Like she, like my auntie said, I don't be around much. But if you call me and read me, me, I'm coming. If you find out anything happened with the family, I'm coming. I want y'all to know my cousin, boy, I love him. You know, even though we weren't close as we should have been, I still love my cousin. All right, guys, I'm going to keep mine simple. I thank y'all for it. I thank y'all for it, and I thank y'all for listening at me. I love you guys. Good afternoon, friends and family. The family has chosen Oak Ridge as their final resting place located at 4301 Rosenberg Road in Hillside, Illinois. The route that I will be taking on will line up west or Madison. Madison to this plains, we're gonna go over the Eisenhower Expressway and turn over the Eisenhower Expressway to Roosevelt, Roosevelt to Manhattan. Amen. As we prepare for our review, we ask you to remain in your seat till I get to your role. After you view, can you so kindly return to your seat? Minister James is going to close us out with a prayer. I'm going to need four flower ladies to assist me, and I'm going to need my Paul Berries to meet me at the double glass doors. Thank you in advance for your cooperation. Can I get some uh, different music? Right before we go that far, we're going to we're going we're going right there. Um, right before we go there, uh, we're going to do. Uh, Back to the program just a little bit. Uh, we're going to go. Uh, family has requested that we do the Old Testament and the New Testament and prayer. So we're going to do that. I'm going to do the Old Testament. Mr. Williams is going to do the New Testament. And man, we'll do the review. We'll do the prayer. And then we'll do the recessional. Okay? So that we're all on the same page. 
Um, from the Old Testament, I'm just going to do it from memory, the 24th Psalm says, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. It says, Who shall ascend into the hills of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the righteousness of the Lord and the God of his salvation. This is the God of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. So lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Put your faith in the king of glory. At this time, Mr. Williams is coming with our New Testament scripture. Say amen for him. Amen. Is it on? Is everybody else on? Amen. Uh, unlike him, I'm going to read the scripture. <laughs> Got a little bit more to say. <laughs> and uh, I will be coming from um, the 14th chapter of John. Where it reads, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. Also, from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and it, suffi it suffices us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have known, not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do, not, do you not believe that I am the Father, and the Father is me? The word that I speak to you, I do not speak of my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me do the work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of my works themselves. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. The Father may be glorified in the Son. For you ask in anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Amen. Amen. Those of you that will be traveling with us, someone will be out in the foyer with funeral stickers. Can I have some music at this time, please?
Excuse me, is the siblings still in the house? Can I have you all? This is your last time. I'm going to give you a moment. Sisters and brothers, before I close, Mike Rant. Can I have six pallbearers at the doors? Six pallbearers, and I need four flower ladies. Three and three on each, on each side at the glass doors. Three and three on each side. We're gonna stand on each side. The family gonna follow behind Mr. Bernard. Please, family, do not leave. Can y'all hear? Can we just say that one more time like this? Y'all say it again. I've got you they said there's one extra plant. You want somebody to come get the one plant? Jack, you got it. It's a big one. Can I have your attention one more time? Minister Williams is going to come, and he's going to give us our closing prayer. Can we, can we all bow our heads and minister Williams pray? Most Heavenly Father, we come today. We thank you, O oh God, for the life of my brother. We thank you, O oh God, that it meant something to us, him being here. We ask your strength and your comfort today, oh God, that we keep him, the memory of him in our hearts. Help us, comfort us, strengthen us as we go on in this life, remembering how we should treat one another. Father God, you've been so good to us, and we want to share it with everyone we know. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Guide us. Give us the light that only comes from you. That we will remember and give you the glory in all that you do. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Now guide us as we drive these streets. Guide our control of our cars. And keep us in safe path. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.